Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is a quiz review of the second online quiz for Chapter 3 on Infancy in the, in the class Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. The first question on this quiz is, how are the findings of Klaus and Kendall's 1970s mother-infant bonding study viewed today? So this is 40-year-old research, and the idea is, has it been corroborated or has it been disconfirmed? Uh, a, contemporary views are in agreement for bonding to be successful, it must happen frequently and early on. B, contemporary views are in agreement. Bonding can be successful even if it happens later in infancy. C, contemporary views are in disagreement. For bonding to be successful, it must happen frequently and early on. Or D, contemporary views are in disagreement. Bonding can be successful even if it happens later in infancy. So the idea here is that the research, uh, first you have to actually know what they said, and then you have to know what the current research says. Their research said it had to happen frequently, it had to happen early on. But uh, the answer here is D. More recent research, contemporary views, say that bonding, um, mother-infant bonding, can be successful even if it happens later. You don't have to panic if you're not there for the first week or the first, you know, you, you've got time. Um, it can still happen. So that's a nice thing to know, especially for those of us who have adopted children. Okay, next question. Which scale measures a newborn's health by assessing appearance, pulse, grimace, activity level, and respiratory effort? Are we looking at the Basso, Beatty, and Bresnahan scale? Are we looking at the APGAR scale, the Glasgow Neonate scale, or the Brazelton Neonatal Behavioral Assessment scale? Well, um, you know, these are all real things. Um, the one we're looking for here is APGAR, and actually APGAR is uh, an acronym. And it stands for appearance, pulse, grimace, activity level, and respiratory efforts. So, you know, there it is. The, the answer is right there. You get a 10-point uh, score, uh, 0 to 10, when a baby's born. All right, number three. Which is an accurate statement regarding neonatal reflexes? So that's newborn reflexes. A, reflexes are the simplest motor activities displayed by neonates. B, reflexes are the most complicated motor activities displayed by displayed by neonates. C, most neonatal reflexes are exhibited one or two months after birth. Or D, most neonatal reflexes disappear shortly after the baby's first birthday. Well, um, actually it's B, reflexes are the most complicated motor activities uh, displayed by neonates. And, and that, that's just what it is. You know, a simple one is something like blinking your eyes, but a reflex can be a grasping, can be a turning the head and rooting and preparing the mouth to suck on the breast. There actually is a lot that goes into them, and it's the sort of thing that's very hard to learn. Um, and so it's these are complex sequences of behaviors that are built in that are part of the reflexes. All right, number four. Which studies showed that classical conditioning is possible in neonates? Now you have to remember what classical conditioning is. That's the Pavlovian, the bell rings, you the dog salivates because of this uh, passive association as opposed to operant conditioning which is the dog training you do something to get a reward or avoid a punishment. All right, A, neonates were taught to wave their arms in response to a tone, or B, neonates were taught to grasp in response to smell, or C, neonates were taught to blink in response to a tone, or D, neonates were taught to smile in response to smell. Well, the answer in this case is C, they were taught to blink in response to a tone, and that's kind of convenient because a tone's a whole lot easier to trigger and, and trigger off than a smell. And blinking is a very simple response. Smiling is complex. Grasping uh, is a little bit complex. Waving arms is a gross motor movement. Blinking is very easy. And so this is the one where, again, the Pavlov, uh, Ivan Pavlov's dogs uh, would salivate in response to a bell. The infants were taught to blink in response to a, a sound as well. All right, number five. In a 24-hour period, what is the typical sleep-wake cycle for a one-week-old infant. Uh, the choices are A, two cycles of waking and sleeping with the longest nap about eight hours, wakefulness for about two hours per cycle, or four cycles of waking and sleeping, the longest nap about two hours, wakefulness for about three hours per cycle, or six cycles of waking and sleeping, longest nap about four hours, wakefulness for about one hour during each cycle, or eight cycles of waking and sleeping, longest nap about three hours, wakefulness for about four hours during each cycle. So are we looking at two, four, six, or eight cycles of waking and sleeping for a one week old infant during the day? Well, the answer is six. It's, uh, so that's C, six cycles of waking and sleeping. 
So the longest nap is about four hours, and they're awake for about one hour during each uh, cycle. Uh, they don't sleep for a real long time in a row. So if you have a newborn, you know you're going to be waking up a few times during the night. Again, that's because they don't sleep a lot at once. They sleep a lot during the day, but uh, across the 24 hours, but uh, not for very long at any one time. All right, number six, cephalocaudal development proceeds A, from the lower parts of the body to the head, or B, from the outer structures of the body inward, or from the upper part of the head to the lower parts of the body, or D, from the inner parts or axis of the body outward. Okay. Cephalocaudal. Cephas, cephalus means head. Caudal means tail. So it's head to tail, which is C, from the upper part of the head to the lower parts of the body. That's why, you know, babies are born with really big heads and they got really short legs. Um, the head has developed more than the legs or the arms. And that's the pattern that we're going to deal with right here. Now, the next question is related to this. Number seven is proximodistal. Uh, development proceeds A, from the lower parts of the body to the head, B, from the outer structures of the body inward, C, from the upper part of the head to the lower parts of the body, or D, from the inner part or axis of the body outward. Well, in this case, the answer is D. Proximo distal. Proximo means like, you know, proximate. It's, it's close. And distal means far away. And so it's close to far away from the spinal cord, from the central axis. And so we have this from the inner part or axis of the body outward. So the torso is bigger at birth than the arms and the legs. Um, because the part that is central has to, had to develop more. You know, that's where the gut is. It's where the organs are. You really got to have those to be able to survive at all. The arms and legs can take a little bit longer. Plus, they're farther away from everything else. All right. Number eight. How does the loss of myelin disrupt a neuron's ability to transmit signals? A, nerve cells lose their cushioning, or nerve cells lose their insulation, or nerve cells can no longer receive nourishment, or D, nerve cells can no longer elongate. Well, the answer is insulation, B. Uh, the myelin is a layer of fat around the axon's uh, length, and because it's an electrochemical impulse that comes down the axon, just like a wire in your house, it needs insulation to keep it from getting short-circuited against other uh, axons. And so the myelin sheathing, which is a layer of fat, is important to keep the nerves insulated and keep the electrochemical impulses separate from each other. Number nine, what is true of infant brain development? A, neurons continuously proliferate, excuse me, proliferate until one year of age, or myelination is complete by the time a fetus is full term, or C, the formation of axons and dendrites contribute to a major growth spurt at the ne of the neonatal brain, or C, the development of intentional physical activity coincides with an increase in brain size. Well, interesting things to think about. In this case, the answer is C, the formation of axons and dendrites. Um, that, so the axon is, is the long part of the, of the cell that carries the transmission. Some of them are very for short, some of them are almost the length of the entire body. And the dendrites are the parts that receive signals from other neurons. The growth of those parts contribute to a major growth spurt in the brain. It says interconnections mostly and the stretching out uh, through the growth of the axon, the formation of axons, I mean. Anyhow, number 10, last one. Baby Bianca watches her mother place a teddy bear in the closet. Moments later, Bianca's big brother, Ben, retrieves the teddy bear as Bianca watches in amazement. Bianca's lack of awareness that the teddy bear exists when hidden in a closet demonstrates the absence of what? A. Relative perception. B. Object permanence. C. Concrete schema formation. Or D. Visual extrapolation. Well, the one we're looking for right here is B. Object permanence. And that's the idea that something continues to exist, that it is permanent, has a permanent status as an ontological object, even when it's not seen, even when you're not witnessing it. And that isn't one of the important things that uh, children develop. By the way, they develop for some things sooner or later than others. The first one is usually is mother permanence, that mom still exists, even if you don't see her. But things like the teddy bear can take longer. Anyhow, that is the end of the second quiz for chapter three on infancy in lifespan development. Thanks for watching.